Hotep and Ma'at, that means I'm offering you truth. I am Asneferka, aka Nef, and I want to welcome you to the Taboo series. So, Taboos stands for taking accountability by owning our shit. It is a live stream series that I started a couple of moons ago to have some very necessary taboo conversations that allow me the opportunity to share some sacred ancient wisdom. So I am an ancient wis I am a sacred wisdom keeper of ancient comedic, ancient African sacred science. I am a farmer, a healing artist. I am a revolutionary. I'm the mother of Tehuti Ma'at, which is this revolutionary instrument that provides raw sources and really is a space to gather high level souls to specifically focus on building institutions that are necessary in order to actualize and successfully step into the completion of the revolutionary process that we're in, right? So the mission of Tehuti Ma'a is to actually build cooperative institutions that will allow us to transition out of the current paradigm that we're in. And I want to go ahead and give the disclaimer off the top that I am not feeling well today. And I decided to get on anyway because it has been a lot happening. I did two streams. Um, last Tuesday, I didn't do a live stream because I was actually down south and caught in a storm. There was a tornado warning. The electricity had gone out. And I didn't want to miss another Tuesday. The previous two Tuesdays, I ended up just following my spirit and just doing two episodes about the eclipse season. So we're still in the eclipse season. I want to just check in with everyone on that first and foremost. And then we're going to get into the topic at hand today, which is all about possession. And I'm putting it in the context of angels and demons so that we could take a look at this kind of modern approach, maybe more so religious approach to um, to what we consider to be possession. And I'm going to put it in an ancient context. And I want to do so in an empowering way so that we can practically connect to and see what we're navigating in the unseen realm, right? Because a lot of us are not aware of what's actually going on behind the veil, right? When we're talking about possession. So I'm also going to reference a little bit of modern Western psychology, as well as our beloved Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, um, who is an African-centered psychiatrist. Um, she's no longer with us, but she's one of the ancestors who's on the board of ancestors for Tehuti Ma'at. But I am going to reference this book that I just recently started reading, Man and His Symbols. I'm not going to read from the book at all, but I am going to make some connection points to how we tend to look at modern psychology and just thinking about the scientific aspect of the mind and when we're dealing with things that he would consider to be primitive, right? Indigenous ways of looking at things such as ghosts or demons or things along those lines, how we're really dealing with the same thing. It's just two different cultural perspectives and we'll get into that. So first and foremost, I want to welcome everybody who's here. If you are here with us live, welcome. Blessing, Sister Simone. I see you're already active in the chat. It's glad to, ha glad to have you here. If you are here with us live, please tune in in the chat. You can go ahead and ask any questions that you have. You can engage in the commentary. And if you do want to join the live stream, I do welcome you to actually join and get on the stream here with me. So I'll go ahead and put that link in the chat. For you to join in. Um, I do want to welcome everybody else who's here catching the replay or the raw play as we like to say. I'm glad that you are here for whatever reason your spirit led you here and just trust that this is a faded connection and there's something here for you. So yes, before I get started, I just want to take a sip of my tea. and touch on all that's been happening with this eclipse energy. And I wanted to express the fact that it's so much more 
than that, it's there's a lot happening right now. Like this month of April, astrologically or astronomically, there's so many significant movements that are pretty rare and just big. So I'm not going to touch on that really deeply in this episode, but I do feel like if you are interested in more information about um, the astrology or just tuning into our network, we put out a moonly report every month. So the April report went out and it has the energies of the month. Um, It has all of our offerings and different programs and our schedule for the month and links to other things that you may find helpful. We also put out a retrograde care guide for this month um, since on April 1st to through the 25th. Mercury, also known as Tehuti, has been retrograde. So we put out a guide that kind of reads into the energy and gives you a practical approach to looking at how that principle functions and this force of nature is influencing us in our day-to-day life so you know how best to align with the energy. So those are the types of benefits to being a part of our community. So I do want to go ahead and put on the screen, if you're interested in joining the Tehutima Militia, which is our membership program, you can go to tehutima.org forward slash join. We have three tiers or ranks of membership. And at any rank, you would get access to the Moonly Report that I said that has all of our offerings. You get access to our private server, which we call the ARC, the African Rehabilitation Center. It's our collaboration with the African War College, also known as the Amos Wilson Collective. So the two institutions, Tehutima'a and the African War College, coming together um, under the umbrella of the Amos Wilson Collective. So our mission here is to really just align with people who are serious about African liberation and particularly those who are leaders, those who are interested in building, nation building and institution building. So if that sounds like you, or even if you just want to support our community service work, then you can get access to all of the chat channels and our exclusive member offerings as well. Um, And if you want to just support our work, you can also just cash app us. So we have our community service work. So you could just go to tiltima.org if you want more information about that. But I will put the cash app on the screen for anyone who wants to support the work that we're doing, support the live stream, and just the share of information. It was really important for me to get on here today because I heard the voice of Mama Baina Bello. For those who are not familiar with her, she is a Um, historian and a brilliant um, woman elder from IT. And I had been watching a lecture of hers. And I remember she said, where there is movement, there is life. Where there is sound, there is life. And really speaking to that being the core element of African culture. And I was like, I really don't want to feel stagnant, right? So I wanted to just move the energy. And it's always important, as difficult as it may be, we always want to listen to our body, of course. But when we create movement, we create life. And for me, when I get online and I get on here to do this, this is work. Or I like to call play. I'm trying to make sure that I honor um, the connection to my sister Tanu and her emphasis on making sure to bring joy and and really make sure that we're having fun in this revolutionary work. And I think that that's the big paradigm shift, right? To take it from a struggle to really having fun with the process of what we're creating and building. So that being said, for me, it's important. I know the importance of transmitting the messages that I'm sharing and making sure that people bring consciousness to or light awareness to the things that are happening behind the scenes that most of us are not aware of. But because we've been going through these big energy shifts that I mentioned, it is significant because naturally everyone's consciousness is rising. So just as you can see, just based on the cultural changes that have been happening on the mainstream, there's just so much more awareness about certain things. You know, people are just paying attention more. 
right? To little things that maybe about 10, 20 years ago, we really didn't give as much attention to. So that's one way to just practically see how the consciousness is rising. Now, the episode that I had initially had planned to do as the next Taboos episode is called Little White Lies. I'm probably going to do that one next Tuesday because the idea of a lie or a little white lie or even secrets is something that's very important for us to deal with, right? Nothing, there's really no such thing as a secret, right? In the divine mind, in the totality, right? In eternity, everything just exists. And as people's awareness and consciousness and gifts come online, it's going to be even more so because a lot of people are not going to be aware. I don't know why that little bubble thing just be popping up. I just don't like it though. But um, anyway, a lot more people are going to be aware and sensitive to the things that you are not saying. Okay, so it's even more important now for us to be in integrity, for us to move in la'at, for us to move in truth. So I had did that whole episode for the first eclipse talking about um, the cosmic court of ma'at and really sharing those seven elements and principles of ma'at. That's going to be important down, like moving forward. It's not just for eclipse season, but recognizing that the eclipse energy is going to be working with us actively for the next year. It is important to really take this year to really integrate and, and embody those aspects of ma'at. So today I wanted to talk about the idea of angels and demons from an ancestral perspective, because I realized that a lot of us are not conscious of the ways that we are possessed. And even our ideas of possession are probably generated by um, superstition, um, some of which has cultural validation. But a lot of it could be from movies, from entertainment, which is weaponized. And I think it's important for us to be aware of what possession is from a neutral place, right? Coming back to my eye, being aware of what possession is without it being so layered in fear because of the kind of like taboo aspect of it, where it's like um, something that's seen as... um, scary and creepy and you know because the movies and all the other things so I want to illuminate some of that so the idea of angels and demons is really significant for us because it exists on a polarity okay so we're dealing with two opposites right And for us to look at that from an African-centered perspective means we don't look at one thing as better or worse. It's not about a hierarchical thing. It's about a complementary thing, right? It's about looking at how these two energies mirror one another. So while we usually think of one as positive or negative, when we look at it neutrally, we're just looking at two different functions. One is active and one is receptive, right? Usually we have one that we would consider masculine and one feminine. But there's always these opposites, right? So in Kemet and Kemetic science, the idea of an angel, I want us to just look at what our iconography, our imagery of an angel actually is. So we usually think of angels from the context of Christianity for the most part, right? Because of all the religious iconography and imagery that we've seen. So we usually see those wings on a human looking entity, right? But they have wings and they're seen to be able to have some powers to to do miracles and to move in a way that's not human. And all of that comes from our ancient sacred science. So in Kemetic science, we would consider what they call an angel to be a neteru, okay? Um, Now, it's important first for us to deal with meruneter, which is what we commonly known as the hieroglyphs, right? The symbolic language of our ancient ancestors. Um, In the ancient language, the word is not hieroglyphs. It's meruneter or meter. 
right? If we actually were to activate our tongue the way that we actually used it in the ancient time, right? To de decolonize our tongue, as my spiritual father, Baba Heru, would say, right? So that's why sometimes you have different interpretations. Sometimes there are interpretations of Merunetra that translate certain sounds and frequencies into a T, and then others who translation translate that same sound as a D. So what Baba had expressed to me that deeply resonates with me is it's more of a clicking sound. It's a, that's why it's a TD. So, right? So in the, me, right, the Merunetter, just to make it easier, because not all of our tongues are awakened like that. Um, it is something to exercise. In the Merunetter, the, it, would translate into divine communication, right? It's seen that we need to be very conscious of the power and the divinity of our ability to create sound and vibration because sound and vibration is the pretty much foundation of creation of all existence, even of this material world, right? Even though even our thoughts vibrate everything vibrates right this cup is vibrating at a certain frequency um the colors that we see are picking up on particular vibrations and frequencies to allow our brain and our central nervous system to calculate and process particular colors so everything is vibrational and that's very simple but it is some one of those things that um somehow is tried to like I don't know, in New Age spirituality, it's like this attempt to make it seem very mystical when it's very simple. And I think it's very important for us to make these spiritual ideas and concepts graspable and simple because it is scientific. It's not it's not um, mystical in the sense where it's like you can't make sense of it. It's logical at the same time. Right. So we always talk about Tehuti and Ma'at. You have to have both the mind and the heart in that synthesis and balance. It's logic and intuition. It's not either or one or the other. It's both and. That's the premise of African sacred science. So that being said, we're looking at this word that I'm introducing you to as what where angels come from, the Neteru. But the divine, the totality of all that is in existence and all that is not in existence is considered to be nter or netter, netter. Many different interpretations in the Meru Netter because the vowels were sacred, they were not written. So we usually just get the main letters. So it's N, T, and R, netter, right? Netter. And when you look at it in that way, you'll see that it's the foundation in most languages that are used today for the word that we know as nature or natureza, right? In Creole, we say natureza. Um, so there's a lot of different languages, even in Dutch, right, that use that same foundation, the N, the T, and the R, and then the vowels vary because we were speaking of the totality of existence and non-existence. Many people think it's the equivalent of the word God. And the reason why I don't equate it to the word God, even though we use the word God to mean that, right? All that is exists in existence, the most high, the divine spirit. But the word itself, God, is masculine. We know that it's masculine because there's literally the opposite word to it or the complementary word to it, which is goddess, which represents the feminine God. So God is inherently a piece, right? It's not the whole thing, right? Because the goddess is the subconscious while the God is the conscious. The God is the masculine and the goddess is the feminine. So when we deal with the sub when we're not dealing with the subconscious, which is things that are not in existence, we're only dealing with the conscious, the things that are in existence. So that's what the God concept represents, what we know to exist, but it doesn't deal with everything beyond that. 
right? And I know that can be a very deep concept to process, but the simplest way I can put it is we know what we know, and sometimes we know we know what we don't know, but we don't know what we don't know we don't know. And we have to actually account for all of that. It's like even in science when you're dealing with um, dark matter or things that are considered to be anomalies like black holes and things that, you know, science can't even comprehend or even begin to explain what that really is because it's unconscious, it's unknown, right? So when we're dealing with inter, inter, it's all that exists and doesn't exist. It's like the beyond us that we're all a part of making up. And when you deal with particular aspects of creation or of the divine, those are considered neteru. So you use the you to make the word a plural. So neteru would be a particular aspect or principle of divinity, of inter, right? So Ra, for example, the sun is a particular principle or aspect of the divine. So Ra is a Neteru. Or you may look at something like Tehuti and Ma'at. Those are Neteru. They are divine principles. They are cosmic principles that make up divinity, but they're not the totality of divinity, right? They're scientific terms that we use to express particular forces and principles of nature. When in the ancient world, when we would depict Neteru or principles, they would usually be shown with wings, falcon wings. This is the first depiction of science of, um, excuse me, angels that we can see, right? Where we would see Ma'at, for example, with the ostrich feather on and then the wings outspread and her arms would be laid out to the side as wings and she's turned to the side or many people may know the um, symbol of ast, or many people interpret or know the common word or name from the Greek as Isis, right? But Rihanna has a tattoo of ast on her chest with the wings coming down underneath her breasts, right? So those are the ancient depictions of what we consider today to be angels. Now, demons are a whole nother thing. Right. So when we look at the study of demonology from a comedic standpoint, our perspective on it was still neutral, just like our perspective of Neteru were neutral. Right. Each principle had its own polarity. So it had, for lack of a better way of putting it, positive and negative attributes. Right. Masculine and feminine attributes. It always there's always two sides of anything, even us as beings, we have our masculine and feminine energy. Even if you're a man or a woman, the energy is neutral. It's not um, linked necessarily to your sex. So it's about how you embody the energy. Now we commonly look at the female as a more feminine energy because it's receptive biologically when you think about it biochemically through hormones, but literally the chatet or a vagina is receiving, right? So it's a receptive energy. So that's how I want you to think about it more energetically. So when we were dealing with the Neteru and the different aspects of divinity, those principles could have been what we perceive as positive or negative. So we had, for example, the energy of Set and Nebetet. People may consider those to be negative energies, but they're neutral in the sense that they represent death and decay, the feminine and the, and the masculine aspect of death and decay, which were complementary to the principles of Ast and Asar, which were the principles of life and regeneration from a masculine and feminine perspective. So Either way you cut it, it's not that one is negative or positive. They just exist in their necessary forces and principles. We apply those judgments. 
based on our cultural orientation from where we are now. So I'm saying that to say in order to really think about angels and demons, we have to look at it from an ancient perspective, from a holistic perspective, from a neutral perspective, not from a perspective of applying judgment to it. So that's the first exercise that you have to do, okay? Because everything that exists in Netter, in the universe, in the multiverse, is necessary, right? It has meaning. It has rhyme and reason. Nothing exists for nothing, right? That's a saying that we have in Criolo. Nada a toa. Nothing is for nothing. So when we look at that and we trust that everything exists for a reason, we would have to look at what is the function and the purpose of angels and demons. So you have higher and lower frequencies. You have energies that are meant to um, express and invoke or evoke the lower aspects of yourself. And then you have energies that are meant to invoke or evoke the higher aspects of yourself. But they're all energies that are neutral. So that means we can embody them. They're a part of us. We exist with them. It's not something separate from us, which is another key component to understanding or understanding things from an African perspective. We have to recognize that there is no separation from anything. Everything is whole and one. But when we make distinctions and we see ourselves as individuals, that's necessary because we have to do both and. But nonetheless, it's still all connected. And when we recognize that, that's very, very important for us to know how possession works. Because how can something enter you or possess you if it is not a part of you? Right? So it's still all interconnected in this divine web. And it serves a purpose. So the demons, for example, they can serve a neutral purpose, which is usually in comedic science, what would be considered the keepers of the threshold right? They are protective energies. They guard certain doorways, right? So demons may exist to protect and preserve something that exists beyond that. So when you overcome or when you um, move past or through a demonic force or energy, right? Which is meant to activate your lower self. So when you fully integrate that part of your lower self and you alchemize it, you move past that doorway and you move into a next stage. And I'm realizing that it's important to have a clear context of spiritual warfare in order to know what is it that you're navigating anyway? What are these gateways? What are these portals that we talk about? It's not to make it complex. That's why I wanted to bring up Carl Jung's work because when we think about modern psychology and the way that mental illness and disease is character characterized, one of the things that I really appreciated was how he made the direct connection to how, quote unquote, in his words, primitive, but just indigenous ancient traditions and cultures were speaking about the same things, but in a way that we don't or most people in modern in the modern world in the western world do not value right because in the eurocentric world it needs to be scientific in a particular way and it was not seen as scientific when our ancestors were talking about demons and ghosts and things of those of that nature, right? So when we were honoring our ancestors and things that couldn't be understood entirely by the Europeans who were coming to study and to objectify the different aspects of our culture, they didn't really respect that. So I did appreciate how Carl, Carl Jung speaks about how the same way it might be easier for someone who is of an indigenous tradition that would speak about possession, for example, someone being possessed by a demon, to process that 
versus someone looking at it as like a psychological disorder, right? Because it means that some when someone goes into a state of psychosis where their mind snaps from the regular order of operations, then usually they're actually possessed by a thought, right? And what we have to recognize is that a thought form is an entity in and of itself. Anything that we think is an entity. And that's actually what we're talking about when we talk about demons. We're talking about energy. And energy usually takes form and connects and adapts to the material world through vibration. And our thoughts are the easiest way for that to happen. So when we're listening to music or watching things on TV that are subconsciously programming us, we don't recognize that that's infiltrating us on the deepest level because it's reaching us through the subtle realm, right? The unseen and unconscious. So we're not fully aware of what ideas and thoughts it's putting into our minds. If you had never seen a particular act of violence, for example, it would never occur to you to do it. But once you see it, then that demon actually has now had access to your mind. And if and that thought, everything that is created wants to continue to exist. So it is seeking more life. It's seeking more energy. So that thought is now going to want to grow right? Because that's just the nature of life. Everything that comes into existence wants to grow and it wants to take up more space. So those thoughts then want to expand in our minds, right? So I want you to think about that in the context of anything that you're experiencing, especially things that we consider to be like very psychological in our common modern way of looking at it, like depression, for example. Depression to me is a form of possession of a lot of what we would consider to be negative thoughts or lower frequency thoughts, right? That are feeding on us. And again, I brought up earlier the importance of movement because where there's movement, there's life. If we can move our thoughts, if we can move our energy, we actually have to take an active approach because depression is very feminine. It brings us in almost too much, right? So to balance it, we have to move the energy out. So that's an important way to look at it, right? So in terms of like dealing with it from a solution-oriented perspective, whenever we're dealing with energy, if it's an imbalance, whether it's overemphasized or underemphasized, we have to balance it, not with matching the same energy, but looking at the opposite energy and bringing in an ex- uh, opposite expression of a healthy opposite expression of the energy. So like I said, depression is feminine, is a negative or a unhealthy, overemphasized feminine element. So you bring in a healthy, active, masculine element, which can be exercise, for example, that can support the body, literally, chemically, right? Because of what happens to your body chemistry when you exercise. And then that movement is genuinely circulating energy throughout your body, but throughout your energy field, your aura, your um, your ka, right? Your emotional body. So on the opposite side, to balance it out, like if we're overactive, because some of us move into our masculine energy, like this was one of the things that was more common for me was I would actually start overworking and keeping myself very busy to not deal with whatever the thing was, right? So that's an overactive masculine energy to do, 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 do and distract, right? So that unhealthy masculine energy can be balanced by a healthy feminine energy on the other side, something like meditation, right? Very intentional silence and stillness to allow yourself to be present. So I just wanted to give that example because um, it's really important for you to recognize in your own life, what are you possessed by? Because we can embody divinity, right? The divine elements of us, but we can also embody the lower 
elements and, and frequencies that we would consider to be demons, right? And I do recognize everything as part of a, a eternal process. So if you haven't watched the previous episodes, I do want to encourage you to watch it because I did share some other very important aspects of comedic science that help us deal with things that are taboo because it's dealing with the underworld, right? And the underworld was called the what, the duat, right? And the what is the 12 hours of the night. So when you think about each hour of the night, it's each hour is a gateway to move us from night into day, right? When the sun is rebirth on the Eastern horizon in the rising. So that's a process that we constantly go through. And it's a microcosm and a macrocosm, right? When we transition, when we die, when we pass, we go back into that darkness and the spirit moves through that space, right? To be reborn. This is in our ancient scientific perspective. The same thing happens every night when we go to sleep, right? We go into the subconscious in our dream state and then we come back forward. And what's really interesting about Carl Jung is he puts a lot of emphasis on the importance of our dreams and the importance of the subconscious realm and how the dream state is just as important as our waking state. Some people argue that it might be more important. I think it's always important to stay in ma'at and recognize the necessity of both, right? But our subconscious always speaks to us through our dreams. That is what that space is. So it's outside of the realm of logic and time and the things that we usually want to use to comprehend things. So one of the ways that we can get clear on what's happening in our subconscious psychology, right? Because that's really what we're talking about when we're dealing with the duat, right? We're talking about the unseen, right? The unknown, And the dream state brings that up to the surface. And that's what I was talking about, about eclipse season is eclipse season always bring, like the veil thins and there's certain energies that we move through astrologically that usually allow us to connect more with whatever is happening deeper. So for example, on the 25th of April, if you're watching this in real time, right, in the current linear time, this Um, this moon cycle that we're in right now is going to climax the eclipse season, even though it's not going to be an eclipse, the next full moon is going to be in Serket, which is the Scorpio energy. It's the fixed water, right? The depths of our emotions coming up to surface that naturally happens during Serket season, right? So The way that I want you to think about that is that the energy just tends to naturally pull out what is subconscious during those particular energies. Um, And then I'm seeing a couple comments coming in. So I do want to acknowledge Master Jedi one of one. Um, I'm glad to be here still going too. So I'm just keeping up with your messages. I've been using Riketi. Okay. Mama Riketi is a um, linguist. I believe. I don't want to under undermine the elders' work, but she does many things. But I know that one of the things that she does do is teach Medunetter. I'm not a student of hers in particular or anyone in particular. I really learned a lot of Medunetter through sitting with different elders, particularly my spiritual father, listening to a lot of lectures, going to Um, the temple walls directly and actually reading through the sacred texts, which is what my spiritual father, Baba Hiru, really encouraged. And what I encourage for people is to go directly to the source, right? So I think people like Mama Riketi are great resources for people who want to learn about um, Merunetar. There's also the shrine of Ma'at based in Harlem in Brooklyn, excuse me, in Harlem in New York. (laughs) So if anyone's interested in more information about that, but I wanted to look at the question here, would purgatory be the Catholic equivalent to the duat? Limbo. Yes. Okay. That's a really, really great question. Thank you. Let me actually take this thing off of the screen. Um, maybe I'll just put it as a ticker in the bottom. 
So that way, if anyone wants to donate to the Cash App, they can still. So we're going to come back to this question about purgatory and the duat. So I want to say yes to answer the question in general. Um, but I want to add the nuance to it because I think that the duat is more than purgatory. And I think that it's important for people to realize that that limbo space is like a process. Like it is a transitionary space between, um, between realms, I would say like it's the, the, the passing through, but I wouldn't say that all aspects of the duat are purgatory or that limbo state what happens is this is a great question the reason why i really think this is a great question is because it really allows me to speak on the necessity of demons from the context i was trying to speak on earlier when i said it's like protecting and they're keepers of the threshold so for example you may end up in limbo if you are in that state of transition and then there's a, a energy that you have to move through that you avoid moving through or that you're unable to move through i don't even want to say unable because we're always put in a position where we can move but we also are doing that divine dance between our destiny and free will right so we always have a choice right so we can choose to rise to the occasion or to the challenge by strengthening ourselves, right? Because everything, every challenge or problem is really just the opportunity to strengthen ourselves. And we can also choose not to, and we can stay in that space. And some people really do get comfortable in that space of stagnicity and stillness. And remember, movement creates life. So what is stagnicity and stillness? Excuse me, not stillness, but because there's nothing wrong with stillness in and of itself. It's all about the context, right? Because even too much of a good thing could be bad. So the point is the context. So if you are just stuck somewhere, right? That's kind of what the energy of limbo is, is when you're stuck and you choose not to move. And when you choose not to move, it stagnates. And the energy stagnates. It creates space for disease and dysfunction. So I like to use agriculture as a farmer as a the best way to describe what I'm talking about because the comedic science is a science that is rooted in agriculture. So when you turn your soil, you're bringing oxygen into the soil, you're, you're creating movement, you're creating the space for life to move within the soil. And you'll see the difference, right? There's non-tilling farming also, but there is a difference. And it depends also what you're growing and all that good stuff, the context of your soil. But usually you want to mix your soil up. You want to amend your soil, which is adding different elements to your soil to build up your soil, to bring more life to your soil. Um, some people add earthworms or like different things that you can add to bring life to your soil. So think about that symbolically because that's the same thing for life, right? Our soil is where we sow our seeds. Our soil is the darkness. Our soil is the subconscious. So we do want to turn our soil. We do want to be intentional about how we feed our soil. If you put death into your soil, then you're going to get death. If you don't put anything into your soil, your soil is going to be depleted and it's going to be lifeless. So we can be intentional about that and create that movement. When we don't move the soil and we don't feed the soil, then our plants reflect that. What grows from the soil or is unable to grow in the soil is a reflection of the quality of the soil. And usually the most fertile soil is the dark black soil, right? So keep that in mind because that darkness, that, that symbolism is very important to how we navigate our lives, right? Even though we've been programmed to consider blackness and darkness to be a negative thing, it's the source of all life, right? When we think about the fact that we all came through the darkness, we all existed in the watery darkness of the womb of our mothers, right? So it's the essence of life, soil, the, the, the seed must go into the darkness of the soil in order to sprout 
and become conscious and bring that light and that life out of the darkness. Everything comes out of the darkness. So like I said, it's one aspect of the duat, but it's not the totality of the duat. We can be in limbo if we choose to stagnate because we're faced with certain demons that We may face them in others or we may face them within ourselves. We may be embodying them within ourselves. And it's our responsibility to exercise those demons. And I like the word exorcism or exercise in that way because literally you got to work those demons. You know, when you create more movement and you challenge them and you exercise them, you allow them to serve their purpose which is protection. And it allows you to rise to your higher self because the angel will always overcome if you allow yourself to embody those divine principles, right? Those angelic forces and be an embodiment of that. Then you move past the lower frequencies because the higher frequency will override it. And that's why the lower frequencies are there. The lower frequencies are there. The demons are there to protect what is behind that threshold, right? So you have to essentially prove that you can move beyond it in order to embody what's next in that phase. And we all move through that way in life because we're all moving towards our enlightenment. We're all moving towards our ascension, right? Our birth of the sun, our rising sun. So we have to move through these different challenges. And when we're in the space, like an energy signature that we're in right now, eclipse season, the energy is all about moving through that darkness and that density in order to strengthen ourselves and become better. So That, to me, is the best way to look at it. Um, I really do appreciate your question, Master Jedi. Um, Thank you. I'm glad you appreciate the analogy. I'm wondering if anyone else has any other questions um, about the topic today. I do... I'll speak a little bit more. I'll give it a while um, to see if anyone has any questions before wrapping up. But I do want to talk about um, being possessed and how to deal with that. Because sometimes it's easier to see how someone else is possessed, right? And like I said, you could be possessed by positive forces or negative forces. That's essentially what we're looking at as angels and demons. But seeing them neutrally and striving to embody our divine principles, right? And the divinity that is indwelling within us. We have to feed that part of us, right? In the other episode that I did for the eclipse season, I was talking about preparing for the solar eclipse by purification, right? Because if our body has a lot of density, then our body is possessed by dense forces and frequencies. So our thoughts, we know about the the gut brain connection, right? So literally what we eat is influencing how we think. So these are all ways that you could think of as inlets, right? To possession. And the same way that we can be possessed by negative foods, we can be possessed by high frequency, clean, holistic ways of living. So I wanted to just speak on that because it is something to consider, right? Sometimes when we're dealing with people, we kind of see how they're possessed by an idea or, um, and again, that could be something we see as a good thing or a bad thing, but it is important to always be in balance and ma'at is sobriety, right? It is important to be sober and to have our feet on the ground, to be grounded and and realistic right like in the in the honoring of the material world and the spiritual world both together not just one or the other because that's what creates psychosis or what we're talking about as like a psychological break where now the demon is actually taking more space within you than you're consciously controlling for yourself in your mind and then it's moving through your life and wreaking havoc in your life, right? So we're meant to be steering the wheel, okay? So usually when we think about possession, it's usually when it's gotten to that point where it's like, okay, is this person even in control of what they're doing? 
But yeah, you still have to be accountable because we are the ones who allow those demons in. So when we go into next Strong's episode on Tuesday about Little White Lies and we're going to be dealing with secrets, I'm going to be talking about that in a deeper context because the way that we give access to us and can be possessed by these entities or thought forms is beyond just what we see subconsciously. It is also through our trauma and how we create patterns and cycles that we recycle in our life to essentially create a a tether, like a connection point between us and lower energies and frequencies or demons as we want, we're calling them, right? So that's an important thing to think about. It's like, what are the shadowy aspects of us that are still giving entry points for us to be possessed, right? And I want to acknowledge this message by Radiant Sunshine. Welcome. Greetings. I'm definitely moving through darkness. I work at an Ivy League that I considered le- I consider legion. Um, how do we deal with a stronghold of those dark spirits who seek to murder the spirit of empaths? Hmm. It's a very great question. Um, hmm. How do we deal with a stronghold of those dark spirits who seek to murder the spirits of empaths? There are many ways that we deal with the stronghold of dense energy, right? Um, As I said in the previous episodes, like the things I've already talked about is our food purification, but there's a reason why we also have in our spiritual practices a beautiful relationship with incense, right? Incense is a beautiful way or certain cleansing herbs, right? Is a really important way that we can use to cleanse and clear energy that goes beyond, right? So for me as a spiritual warrior, I first begin with the psychological approach because we have to deal with the unseen realm and we have to create protection for ourselves. Now, going to war <laughs> with demons is a whole nother ball game, right? For me, I would consider that as a, a high priestess, like that's my, that's my work, right? And it's an interesting thing because I've been navigating a lot recently how I have more work or play, as I like to say. And it's like, other people can't really comprehend or perceive like what that is like to be warring energetically, especially right now where there's so much darker spirits, as you called it. So first and foremost, you have to focus on the inner healing because if those energies have an access point to you, those are the buttons that they go to push. So if you have incest, if you have Um, experiences of um, sexual abuse, or if you've been the perpetrator of those things, if you have guilt, if you have shame around anything in your life, if you have any unhealed wounds, abortions, um, and this goes for men and women, all of those things are access points to us emotionally, which means energetically, psycho-spiritually, access points that those energies are going to go right for because their goal is going to be to possess you to take up more space to pull you into the darkness right so when you look at the duat when you look at all of our ancient sacred texts such as um, the pyramid text or the book of doors the book of gates or the Pertinru, the book of coming forth from night into day, misnomered as the book of the dead, you see on the temple walls or even um, even in the actual tombs, you'll see the movement of the duat on the boat of Ra. You're in the boat of the sun. We have to recognize that we are solar powered beings. When we honor our African cosmic consciousness, we are the light in the darkness right? Just like Ra, the sun is the light in the darkness of the cosmos, right? It is suns, solar systems create order within the chaos of space, okay? So we have to fully embody 
that solar energy, that creative life force. So in order to do that, we have to do the healing work and the purification work. That's very essential before you go into actively warring. Start within yourself first. Because when you embody the light and you walk in, the the darkness dissolves within the truth of your authentic energy of who you truly are because it cannot withstand it. So you bring that light, whether that's through your words, just your presence, through your love, whatever it is that you may do. There could be someone possessed and you genuinely with, with genuine, true, sincere love Give that person a hug and that can transform the energy. The thing about a space like being in an Ivy League institution is they're very Eurocentric. They're very cold spaces. People don't touch each other. It's very um, linear. Everything is about logic. It's not dealing with the emotion, right? It's facts over feelings. (laughs) So those spaces can be very toxic in that sense. So you have to bring in the embodiment of Ma'at. You have to bring in the embodiment of both and. It's facts and feelings. We don't lose one by bringing in the other. So the embodiment of the Neteru is the best way, right? Someone on the previous episode that I did said that I was a Neteru of beauty. And that was such a beautiful thing for me because I felt recognized. Because to embody Heteru, right? The, the energy of of love, of beauty is to be magnetic and attractive, but you have to embody that from within. It's not a superficial thing. It's not about putting on the makeup and all the the things and the clothes. It's about being that beauty. It's about being that love and that radiates, right? So this is how we embody anything. We be it. So we can embody any of the divine forces. Sometimes to go into battle, like we have to look at which Neteru were present to defeat certain demons, such as Apep, which is a parasitic energy and the enemy of Ra. That's our greatest demon. And that's the the energy that we're in when we're dealing with eclipse season is when when the moon creates that shadow over the sun, it was seen as Apep seeming to overpower Ra in a moment during the daylight where the darkness takes over, right? So that's dealing with the energy of that parasitic force of Apep. And one of, just as an example, one Neteru that was used to combat and to defeat Apep is Serket, the scorpion energy. Serket is a feminine energy. And when you're dealing with Serket, you're dealing with an energy of preservation or even just looking at the nature. Hi. Even just looking at the nature of a scorpion, right? So the beautiful element about embodying Serket is the inner standing of how to preserve yourself. Contraction and expansion. The scorpion contracts when it's not safe so that its stinger can have more force to come out and go forward. It extends itself and it's expanded when it's safe. If it's in danger, it contracts so that it knows it needs to strike. Those are the thing principles that you can embody to bring in circuit into your life. Knowledge of self is key, right? You have to know yourself. That's why I always encourage people, if you don't know how to do your own reading, get a reading because you need to study the 360 degrees of knowledge of self, which is the wheel, the cosmic wheel, right? Your star print, your natal chart, your birth chart. When you were born in that ecliptic of the zodiac wheel, there's 360 degrees of yourself that you can master, that you can know, that you can connect with and and understand how to navigate and use your own energy. It's not an imprint that's on you. It's an energy signature that you get to work with, right? And when you're conscious of it, you know where your strengths are and you know the areas you need to strengthen, right? So you know how to function. Those are things that are really important. So when I said the contraction and expansion, just as an example, to be clear, you're in this space, Ivy League space, there's a lot of darkness there. You're doing your own spiritual work, but you know when to contract. You know when to go into yourself to preserve yourself, to conserve your energy. Because you know you're going to have to come out with force to protect yourself. 
right? So it's not always about being on defense. You have to know how to embody these divine principles and forces through your words, your deeds, and your being, your actions, right? So I think that that's really important. And because I mentioned the reading, I do want to put up on the screen if anyone's interested in booking a reading with me, or you can also do an astrological consultation with um, our sister, Danny. You can go to coinsandkaris.com to book that. So I'll put that up on the screen. I'm also going to put the email. You can also email and text. You can text 646-883-MAAT, or you can um, email grow at tehutimaat.org. So Coins and Kari's is one of our um, cooperative spaces. It's our spiritual marketplace where we offer spiritual goods and services. So my Oracle readings, I do provide your star print, your natal chart reading. If that's something specifically that you want also, we can do that. I do everything from a comedic scientific perspective. Um, but you can also do an astrological consultation with Danny as well. Um, and then, so thank you for that question, Radiant Sunshine. So you just have to be Radiant Sunshine and embody that. And that's exactly how you'll deal with those energies. I did mention the incense because sometimes you got to just come in with the dragon's blood. Sometimes you got to come in with the kofal and the frankincense and the myrrh. And you got to come in with the sage and, and clear out the energy intentionally. But you do want to be, you know, spiritually sound and stable within yourself. Um, before going to war, do we create demons in our life? Yes, we, we're creative beings. So our thoughts can create things, right? But everything has a source, right? There's nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. That's, um, a quote from Octavia Butler. So shout out to Octavia Butler, because she's also on our board of ancestors and, the reason why I say that is because usually the energy is recycled in some way or form, um, but it is possible. The same way we have light workers, we have dark workers. We have people who are here to create evil, and yeah, that, that can be done. You can create demons in your life, um, but it's important for us to know what side of the scale we're here to operate on. Are you here to... Um, create chaos or are you here to birth order and yeah we're on the side of tehuti ma'at of restoring universal law and cosmic order to the planet which is organically happening and transpiring right now but some of the ways that we do create demons or welcome demons into our lives is through our thoughts it's through our sexual vulnerability mo most commonly so in the previous like the earlier episodes I talked a lot about that because our sexual trauma and perpetuating sexual trauma is one of the ways that the evil forces do work um strongest right which is why they've had such a stronghold on the planet um is through a lot of very evil acts, um, you know, sexual acts, especially doing sexual rituals, um, abusing children, you know, things along those lines. Like it's it's a very real um, thing. You literally have the church of set. You have people who worship, um, you know, there's Luciferians, right? So that, that, that is a sector of energy. There's a lot of malevolent energy evil forces on the planet is naive to think that everything is love and light. Because when you go into the subconscious during a degenerate cycle that we're in right now, there's actually an imbalance of malevolent energy. There's more dark forces than there are light. And as the energy is tipping and we're coming more into that equinox period where we're balancing out the energy, we need more of that light force, that solar force to bring order to that chaos. Um, I'm just going to look at some of these literally seek to steal my joy and inflict emotional distress. Yes. Sis. So you definitely need to know when to contract into yourself. I definitely have an altar and light for daily. Okay. That's great. So I think that that's great. That's a great way for you to actively participate in the spiritual warfare. Um, 
Love, 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 love up on yourself. I know it sounds cliche, but that's the energy. That's the frequency that you need to embody because through love, we create compassion for others as well. So sometimes we can go into victim mode when we're at war and when we're being attacked. And it's very important to recognize the necessity of that demon. What is that demon strengthening in you? Take a position of power, take a posture of power within the situations that you're in. That's very, very important for us all to do. Um, and then gonna leave that place not worth my peace when I have them looking at me smirk, smirking across the screen. But yes, I will continue to be sunshine, been working hard at it and being gentle with myself. That's perfect. I'm so glad you have to be, you have to give yourself grace and you have to trust that as a warrior, right? As a solar warrior, you are in the places that you are in for a reason and you have everything that you need. And when it's time for you to move on and your mission is complete, you will know that, right? So just remember some thresholds, you have to move past the demon. If you just change space and you haven't completed your mission, you're going to face that same demon in another form. So just be very clear. Make sure that you are doing that internal work and really clear and communicating with that divinity within, right? Because that's how Netter speaks to us is through within, it's through our heart. That's why I said go into the frequency of love, come into the heart. The heart connects us to the universal forces, right? The direction inward leads us in all directions, guides us, guides us from within. So pray, you know, get that clarity, meditate and get clear about how you're feeling. I really don't like when they just be doing that. I'm sorry. Like, I, I can't with this technology. I don't know if y'all can see that little thumbs up thing, but I've been seeing it a lot. If anyone knows what that's about, let me know. I mean, I I understand. <laughs> I would say I understand what it, what it is because it is important for us to recognize the technological side of the warfare that we're in. Right, because technology in the two dimensional sense, virtual reality fragments us. That's also why it's very sometimes I don't want to get online because I know the spiritual battle that takes place energetically within this space. But I also feel a responsibility, which is why I told y'all I felt I needed to come and move the energy. So we never know the importance of our voice, of our energy, of our presence in a particular space. So you have to be able to know when to push through and to find your strength and when you need to retreat. Okay. So you know what to do, sis. I trust you um, have all the answers that you need and just go inside. That's always the best wisdom that I can give anyone is go inside. Because even when I do any type of reading for anyone, as a guide, I'm guiding you within yourself. I'm not guiding you to rely on me or to depend on me. I'm not telling you I have all the answers. I share what I have as a reflection of you. And I'm here being on purpose, doing what I'm here to do. And my mission is to make sure that every other person is guided within themselves so that they can live in the truth of their purpose, their purpose I as well, right? So that being said, are there any other final questions? Because I am going to close off. I want to, I need to retreat and just be within for a while. I appreciate the questions that came through. So I want to shout out those who were active in the chat today. I hope you're still with us too, Sister Simone, Master Jedi, and Radiant Sunshine. Thank you again for your participation. Um, we will be back on Tuesday, nets are willing, with another episode of Taboos. And I'm going to move into the episode that I had been working on, um, Little White Lies. Okay, so we're going to deal with secrets and how they connect us and tether us to entities and forces that want to create chaos in our lives, right? So that way we can know exactly how to navigate that 
and how to create order within our lives through embodying truth and honesty. Okay. Thank you too, sis. I I give thanks. And I don't even know if this is a, I don't know if you're a male or female, but um, I appreciate you. And I will see you all next Tuesday. All right. So travel light. Have a beautiful night again. And some quick housekeeping before I go. Please like the video if you enjoyed and found value in anything that was shared today. I just ask that you like the video. Please share also if you feel um, like you know anyone who would benefit from what was shared today. You can follow us on Instagram at Tehutima'at. I'm going to get back active on the Instagram soon. And if you want more information about our revolutionary instrument and the work that we do, our Organic Food for the People initiative, our Sankofa youth workshops, and all of the other programs that we offer, go to tehutima.org to learn more about how our organization functions. And again, like, subscribe, make sure you hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when we go live. Um, because sometimes things are just going with the flow of eternity. Okay. So sometimes there might be a spontaneous live stream. And if you want to be able to be notified when we publish anything, hit the notification bell. All right. I will see you next Tuesday. Power. <laughs>